What's cracking, big dogs? Welcome back to the channel. Welcome back to the HQ. Thank you for joining us today. It is Tuesday, and now that it is June, we are going five videos a week. Every Tuesday, I'm going to be joined by my man, Noah, a.k.a. at FB God on Twitter. Make sure you're following him if you are not already. Today, we're going to we're gonna dive in a little bit deeper. I know you don't usually get this type of content on, on a lot of fantasy football channels, we're going to dive into the uh, the offensive lineman movements that happened around the NFL this offseason, whether it was through the NFL draft, whether it was through free agency signing, retirements, whatever. Um, some of the teams that were most impacted by offensive line changes this offseason. We want to talk about what kind of impact that's going to have on the 2019 fantasy football season because, you know, uh, a lot of the times running backs – are only as good as the holes that are opened up for them. Uh, same thing with quarterbacks. You know, they need that blocking. And uh, there were definitely a lot of movements going on this offseason when it comes to the O-line. So we're going to break down probably six or seven teams that had a lot of uh, ha had a lot of transactions going on and their depth charts were shaking up a little bit, uh, mostly in, in a positive manner. Um, I, I don't know if there were any teams that really took like a monster hit on the O-line, but there were definitely some teams that um, – are on the up and up. So without further ado, Noah, I know you've got a lot of teams listed here. I know you've got a lot of fucking bullet points for the Jacksonville Jaguars. <laughs> First of all, welcome, welcome back to the HQ. What's um, up? Feel free to jump in anytime and, and talk about the Jacksonville Jaguars. Spoiler. All right, so we're going to start off with the Jacksonville Jaguars. And a common theme throughout this is a lot of these teams have a negative stigma around them where when you think of them, you think that they're a terrible offense and you think their offensive line is awful. Uh, one in specific later that we'll talk about. But right now we're going to look at the Jaguars, who last year PFF ranked them as the 22nd best line, whereas the year before they were 15th. So they weren't elite, but they were kind of middle of the pack. And that's all you really need when you have Leonard Fournette running behind you. Um, as for like their efficiency this past year uh, compared to the year prior, they were 21st in adjusted line yards, which kind of standardizes like your rushing attack and your run blocking. Uh, they were 19th in stuff percentage, which is uh, if you get hit at or behind the line of scrimmage. And they were 27th in pass protection per pro, uh, pro no, football outsiders uh, at a 9.3% uh, adjusted sack rate. And if you compare those to the year prior, they were 13th in adjusted line yards. They were fifth in pass protection and they were uh, 10th in stuff percentage so they all really dropped off last season and you look as to why that happened their center Brandon Linder missed seven games Andrew Norwell former all pro left guard missed five Jeremy Parnell missed three Cam Robinson their left tackle missed 13 and only AJ can who was probably their worst offense lineman out of those guys who the fuck is that guy? I don't, dude, I don't know any of these guys. But can. <laughs> they re-signed him. That's the tough thing about this video is I can't name these guys off the top of my head. So um, so pretty much everybody is returning this year, except for Jeremy Parnell, who was one of the better, better offensive linemen. But they invested a second-round pick in Jawan Taylor, who was one of the better uh, tackles coming out of college. Uh, he kind of slipped in the draft due to, like, some injury concerns. But Yeah, they kept mocking him to Jacksonville in the first round. They thought yeah. – like he was going to be their, their pick. Um, I, I think when Josh Allen kind of fell to seven, they had no other choice but to take him. And they're yeah. probably pleasantly surprised when he fell to the second round. Mm -hmm. But if you look at Jawan Taylor, he only gave up 10 quarterback pressures in 2018 uh, and was a second ranked run blocking guard in the SEC. So he can really do it both on in the run game and the passing game. And with Nick Foles, like a new face in this offense, he's going to need all the help he can get with uh, pass protection and Leonard Fournette not being really an efficient running back and, you can see by that stuff percentage the year prior that they're going to probably open up more holes for him. And, you know, he's always that big play threat when he's on the field, when those ankles aren't falling off of the bottom of his legs. So um, just all in all, Brandon Linder, fifth highest graded center last year before he got injured. Andrew Norwell was the second best pass blocking guard uh, in 2017 and 10th last year. Um, as I said, AJ Ken is kind of middle of the road. They did resign him three years, 15 million. Uh, Juwan Taylor's out and Cam Robinson kind of shit the bed as a rookie. But he picked it up last year in the few games that he did play. So if you if you look as a whole, they're not going to be an elite line, but they're certainly be a lot better than they were last year. It was a line that only allowed one player to rush for over 4.0 yards per carry, 
Can you guess who that was? <laughs> I can guess only because I just looked at your notes. <laughs> so you wrote, but this would have really pissed me off had I not seen this coming and you fucking threw out Blake Bortles at me. <laughs> the boat. He was the only player with more than 50 ru- or more than 20 carries to average more than 4.0 yards per carry. He ever had, he actually averaged 6.3, which is like two Leonard Fournettes, which is pretty good if you ask me. <laughs> And yeah, I mean, you look at you look at Jacksonville, and I guess like the overall arching theme was that they were like very good two years ago, and then all of the injuries took place last year, and it caused them to be a down year, as well as like the Fournette injury. So it was kind of like the perfect storm of them just looking like a complete chit show with Blake Bortles, and their offense was just one of the worst in the NFL. Do you expect a bounce back this year? Um, I mean, like, I don't, I don't necessarily think Nick Foles is anything special but he's better than Blake Bortles uh I would be surprised if Leonard Fournette made it the full 16 games I will probably be targeting Raquel Armstead in uh maybe not season longs but he will he'll probably get his opportunity to be one of the 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 top waiver wire pickups at one point throughout the year because if Fournette goes down you know they got rid of TJ Yeldon they got rid of Corey Grant so they don't have like really any backups there they picked up for blue Alfred (laughs) Alfred extra fucking medium blue (laughs) you know, I, I just think that right, Recall Armstead is, is a fantastic, like, weight-adjusted um, speed score guy, like a weight-adjusted athlete at the running back position. So I think, you know, behind a good offensive line, he could do, he could do some damage this year. So I like him. Yeah, he's, he's kind of a direct replacement for Leonard Fournette. If you look at yeah. Alfred Blue, he's always sucked. He's also from LSU, but he's, never, he's not a pass catcher. He's not particularly great by the red zone. They also added Benny Cunningham, who hasn't had, like, 50 touches since, like, 2012. So yeah, if like 12th round or later in like a seasonal league, why not just take a shot on a guy who's probably going to start like six or more games just because of Leonard Fournette's ankles? Yeah, I, I tend not to draft the run, uh, the the waiver wire, especially or the um, the handcuffs early, like you know, like in August September, because what happens is you end up drafting drafting the handcuff, and then two to three weeks in, the guy probably doesn't get injured, and you end up being like, "Fuck, I need to drop him anyways." So I figure. Take you know, take a stab at someone later in the draft that maybe has more upside or has a has a path to touches early on in the year, and you know maybe a couple weeks before anyone gets hurt, like maybe week four, Leonard Fournette is still healthy, then maybe grab Raquel Armstead after someone else drops him, so you didn't have to you know kind of keep him on your bench for for three or four weeks in the beginning of the season. Yeah, that's a good strategy. I always get stuck with drafting handcuffs and then dropping them, and they break out. I do. Yeah, that's the thing. Just there's no point of fucking uh, drafting them because the, like handcuffs never do anything within the first couple of weeks of the season. You know. Yeah. Alvin like, Kamara's rookie year, I drafted him and I dropped him for Tariq Cohen. Then I dropped him for Jamal Williams. So I kind of got screwed all around. <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> I just like making moves. Can't hit a, a nope. moving target. Yeah. No wonder I didn't let you on the fucking video side of things. <laughs> all right. Let's move over to uh, the Atlanta Falcons now. You know, personally, this is one of my favorite times of the year because I start putting out videos like my do not draft videos um, because those are those seem to be based on the comments I get like personal attacks to people. So if there's a guy that I don't like on that list, people take it super personally because they want to draft them and I tell them reasons why they shouldn't draft them and then they get real mad on the internet about this. And despite my hate for Devonta Freeman, their offensive line upgrades were real, right? Just a couple of years ago, they were considered like one of the elite offensive lines in the NFL or, you know, very close to being one of them. And they I think were, they were number two, two years ago. Yeah, like they were, they were right there. And like that should have been a strength for the team. Um, but they, they fell off and they fell off into like the middle of the pack where it's kind of like a danger zone because you don't know where you're going to go from there. Uh, they, they had um, injuries derail them. They've had, you know, a few other things. Brandon Fusco was released, but he didn't do anything last year Andy uh, Levitre retire so they lose some pieces but neither of those guys were like a core piece of their offensive line last year but what they did was take two offensive linemen in the first round they took Chris Lindstrom this kid from Boston College 14th overall they traded back into the first round to grab Caleb and Gary uh, I think it was like the 29th pick or something overall my, my point you know uh, behind Devonta Freeman in this whole thing is that neither of those these guys while they are good run blocking guys like if you're going to draft or, uh, an offensive lineman in the first round. They better be a good all-around lineman. These guys are very heavily um, skewed towards the passing game. Both are very, very, very good in the pass blocking game. Lindstrom allowed zero sacks last year and just three hurries all, all season. And I'm pretty sure 
uh, Caleb and Gary allowed one quarterback hit the entire season. So again, like, I don't think this was a move for the running game. I think this was more for like mm -hmm. Dirk Cutter coming in and them wanting to be a 65, 70% um, passing offense. And the weird part about it is they, they did this like right after they signed a bunch of offensive linemen in free agency. So they signed two interior uh, linemen, James Carpenter for $21 million. And then J Jamon, 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 Jamon Brown for $18 million. So clearly, you know, you saw what their plan of attack was this offseason. They wanted to re-bolster up that offensive line because we saw how dominant Matt Ryan was, you know, when he had that offensive line. Um, neither of these signings are, are, like, great in my opinion, Carpenter and, and Brown. But, you know, they add depth, if nothing else. And that's, that's usually something that as soon as teams start getting injuries on the offensive line, depth always becomes a problem. Um, so with, with, with Cutter coming in, being extremely pass-heavy, adding all these pass blocking linemen, you know, I think it's wheels up for Matt Ryan. I think it's wheels up for Julio. I think it's wheels up for Calvin Ridley. Still not wheels up for Austin Hooper though. So don't draft us. <laughs> wheels up for Mohamed Sanu, just everybody. And I think there's some weird stat that I think they play 13 of their 16 games indoors. And yeah, I, don't think, I don't think they play outside of a dome until like week 11. Yeah, that's ridiculous. Like Matt Stafford or Matt Ryan, Matt Ryan's going to be probably a top five quarterback again. Uh, he's he's been really consistently elite these past like three four years and with those with with those weapons and obviously the offensive line rookies can be hit or miss but the fact that they invested in depth as well so if they do miss or if they do get injured they still have Carpenter and Jamon or whatever his name is uh, as backups <laughs> Jamon Noah Jamon <laughs> so yeah I, I totally agree with that like obviously Devonta Freeman has his injury woes and stuff like that but if they're gonna be a high powered offense and they're gonna be in the red zone a lot. Uh, I think his ADP will drop as time goes along because people are going to be seeing like all these videos and different articles about uh, how his knees don't work and he just bangs his head into the ground. So uh, I think it'll, it might drop to the point where it's worth a risk in like the fifth round. So um, especially in this offense, dude, he's, he's fucking moving up in ADP though. That's a problem. Is he really? Yeah. Like I strike that from the record. All of that. <laughs> I mean, you're the one editing these videos. <laughs> too long with it. <laughs> no, that's too much fine. work for me. I'm done, yeah. with Atlanta. I'm done with Devon Freeman. I'm done with Austin <laughs> Hooper. All right. Well, are you done with Christian McCaffrey? <laughs> no, I would. I would like. I would like some more Christian McCaffrey, please. Well, you're gonna like him even more after these points. So last year, Carolina, their offensive line consisted of Chris Clark, Taylor Moten, Greg Van Roten, that kind of rhymes. Uh, Ryan Khalil and Trey Turner. Sounds like and, a bunch of goats. Yeah, herd of goats, but there's like five of them. <laughs> um, so Carolina, despite these guys, like none of them were really elite other than Moten and um, Trey Turner's like middle of the pack. They ranked 11th in adjusted line yards, 7th in stuff percentage, and 10th in pass protection. So they were like ahead of the pack in terms of like blocking efficiency and stuff. I was surprised because that was right after they lost Andrew Norwell too. And Nor yeah. that was like the year after Norwell was all pro. They lose him and I'm like, Christian McCaffrey's yards per carry were at like 3.7 or 3.8. And I was like, bro, he's about to like be – be on fucking Trent Richardson status, huh? And then he hit that riff raff and blew Wrong. The up. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, but also, they also lost Daryl Williams, who was 2017's highest graded right tackle and the third highest graded tackle overall. And I was looking into this because they did draft Greg Little, who is also uh, a tackle, and they have Trey, not Trey Turner, um, Taylor Moten, who was a rookie last year, who's a tackle. And I was wondering why they really invested. They're talking about moving Daryl Williams into left, like the left guard position which probably doesn't take as much like finesse as a tackle position. So maybe he can be as good, but I don't know why you'd move somebody who is like at Daryl Williams level into like a lesser position or out of position at least. But we'll, we'll see what happens with that. Taylor Moten last year as a rookie, wasn't really expected to be what he was. Uh, he ranked as one of the best tackles, the 12th best pass blocking tackle and 16th overall. Um, they brought in Matt Paradis to replace Ryan Khalil. Paradis was the number two center, number two run blocking center. So when McCaffrey's running up the middle with those fucking massive shoulders we've been seeing, uh, <laughs> he's, he's going to have somebody blocking for him at least. Uh, as I said before, Trey Turner was the 23rd and 24th best guard in 2017 and 2018 respectively. And Greg Little, they drafted very, him around very two. respectful of you. <laughs> very, very respectful. Uh, um, he only allowed 46 pressures over three years in the SEC was a much worse run blocker so maybe that's why they move him to left tackle because you're just trying to uh, protect the QB's blind side and stuff but um, as we all know Cam Newton his shoulder doesn't work he's a vegan and he was a virgin for a month um, so uh, sure. yeah, I just drafted him in my startup 
well, this it's a good thing because now he's throwing today and their offensive line, I think, could sneak into like the top five. Last year, they were already very good and they're replacing Van Roten and Ryan Khalil, who is getting older, and um, Chris Clark. I don't even know anything about him. So they, they really have one of the better offensive lines heading into this year. And you look at the playmakers they have. They have uh, DJ Moore and Curtis Samuel, guys who create after the catch, uh, really explosive athletes. They have Christian McCaffrey out of the backfield. Um, Greg Olson will probably be up uh, announcing games with Booger McFarlane, so they'll probably have Ian Thomas out there looking like T Grizzly. So, yo, yo, chill. Go <laughs> <laughs> in his fucking player profile or picture. If I if I figure out how to like actually edit a video, I'll put a picture of him right, wait, like here and it, here. It's, it's so easy. I could probably do that for you and send it over. You need to figure out how to not like fucking expand the picture <laughs> so it's like scaled out to a ridiculous level. Because I was like, I remember you showing me last time, and it was good, and I was like, wait. When I watched it, for some reason, it was, like, scaled out, like, so – in such weird proportions. I was like, this isn't what I said okay to. Yeah. Um, think about that. I kind of, like, used a free trial of a video yeah. editor. <laughs> I used a free trial of a video editor and wanted to export it. Uh, it said I had to pay for it, and I wasn't really committed to that, but I didn't want to re-edit the video. So um, I kind of got stuck in a hard place, but we'll move past Wait, that. So and I'll put you, up how did you export it? Then. I had to buy the thing. <laughs> you had to buy it? Yeah. What program? Uh, I don't even know. It's like, I think it's Russian. <laughs> I just... Russian? Wait, you don't have a Mac, right? No, I do not. Movavi. That's what it's called. You're a fool. I do have a... I can give you... I don't know like what a good editing software for you would be, but I can give you my Adobe sign-in and you can get uh, Premiere Pro, but that's like obviously a very advanced editing. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not at that level yet. Yeah, no, it's just, I mean, it's, you could do simple shit on it. I just like, every time you click something, seven fucking things pop up and it's like, all right, I'm done. All right. And that was your editing talk of the day. So now, uh, <laughs> that, that's for you guys. Don't buy Movavi unless they want to sponsor <laughs> somehow. So, um, just, just looking at the Carolina Panthers offense, I really think that as an offensive line who ranked, um, higher up last year, I think they were 17th per pro football focus. I think with these additions and just the returns of these like elite players, um, both Williams and uh, Norwell, as, along with bringing in Paradis, I think they could really be top of the pack and help uh, Christian McCaffrey continue that efficiency he saw last year on those heavy touches. I didn't realize that uh, Carolina's line was as good. Their their offense is going to be like – actually, I can't really figure out what I like in that offense outside of McCaffrey, to be honest with you. Like, there's, there's a lot of hype around DJ Moore, obviously, but the more I listen and, and see things, the more people are getting hyped up about Curtis Samuel – and it, like it, it almost Did you see seems that hitch route he ran. Ooh, what a hitch route! I don't know. People are just posting like hitch routes on like every single player. I absolutely fucking hate Twitter <laughs> at this time of the year. Like it, it, it gets me so frustrated. I'm really thinking about shutting down Twitter. To be honest with you, it gives me yeah. such like it gets me really angry. Like I'm not usually an angry person. Actually, I'm I'm actually pretty angry. Like nine times. <laughs> yeah, I've been fired like 15 times. <laughs> that, was, that was your own fucking doing. Yeah, I kind of brought that upon myself. Yeah, come on now. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it, it's like, it, it almost feels like the the 49ers running back situation to me, where it's like, yeah, people might be really good in that situation, and it might end up being a good offense, you know, and it's, it's Kyle Shanahan's running back, but like, there's a lot of mouths to feed, and it seems like we're not going to get any sort of consistency. It seems like it's going to be really volatile. Do you have, like, one guy out of that wide receiver group, or I guess out of Samuels or DJ Moore that you're really into? I don't know. I looked into it. I think Samuel, uh, Curtis Samuel finishes a wide, re wide receiver or two better on a weekly basis more than DJ Moore. And everything you heard about was how DJ Moore was, like, so good as a rookie. He had, like, great numbers at the end of the year, but – not much consistently. Yeah, more. I, I like I like where more is at because he hit that like 700 yard receiving mark, and that's what I like to see for like rookie wide receivers, right? Because you have guys like James Washington who put up like 200 receiving yards, and people think he's going to break out this year. Like when you're going to break out, the normal like you know rate for that is something like 600, 700 yards your your uh, freshman year, and then your second year you're into that like 900,000 yard range, and then you're finally ready to be like that top tier wide receiver. Like that's the normal rate that we see wide receivers go so I like where DJ Moore was at Curtis Samuel again you got to remember that he missed his whole you know his whole rookie year as well with the I forget what injury it was some weird leg injury I think you have to fact check me on that Maybe. but 
I know. Like, that's what I'm seeing, too, is that he did finish better down the stretch. Like, he was averaging more targets, receptions, and yards a game, I believe. But there was also, like, three games, I think, without Cam Newton. So, it's, like, hard to take that sample size kind of seriously. And at the end of the day, it's like, do you really want Curtis Samuel in your lineup over DJ Moore? It's like, if you're on – I mean, not that their ADPs are close, but the way people are talking about it, it's almost as if people are pretending that they'd rather have Samuel than Moore. And I – I, I can't imagine that that's actually the case. I, I think Moore is just a much more well-rounded, like Stephon Diggs-ish type player with type upside. I think I think Cam Newton is my biggest concern, to be honest. Yeah, I think he finished as QB eight or better in each uh, season of his career, other than two. But he's just throwing now. I mean, you'll have to monitor what he's doing throughout the offseason. But he really doesn't have like a number one option. Maybe McCaffrey, but like all his receivers are like six one and under. And I know you don't need like that six foot four playmaker anymore. But I mean, it's nice in the red zone. Well, that's yeah that's why it's like that's why when you look at like the Niners backfield it's like yeah they all have potential and they all could be explosive and shit but like they're all 203 not, pounds right there's not yeah it's like okay 203 pound guy come here <laughs> get hurt okay next 203 pound guy come on it's like none of them you, you don't feel good about any of them which is why I'm taking the cheapest of them which is why I might end up with Samuel because I, I more seems like one of those players who's going to get more and more hype as the offseason progresses you know and might end up in that fifth like that fifth round range where people are you know expecting the breakout and at that point it's like yeah Newton has finished as a top eight quarterback but most of that is due to the the rushing production so yeah it's a weird situation there it's just it's C-Mac or bust pretty much pretty much but I'm not I'm fine with that I'll take C-Mac all day long yeah you're, I mean you're gonna have to have a top two three pick to get C-Mac unfortunately um let's move over to the Cincinnati Bengals now they have been bad for quite some time uh, they were 26th in run blocking per PFF last year. They were 28th in 2017. And when you look at football outsiders, they were 22nd in 2018, 24th in 2017. Um, so for any of you guys that want to see like offensive line stats or rankings or whatever, footballoutsiders.com has offensive line ranks for free. Pro Football Focus, you have to have a, uh, a package to their, I think, Edge subscription, which is only like 30 or $25 for the entire season, which I think is well worth it. Um, but those, those are some spots that you can go check out offensive line rankings. What I see for Cincinnati, though, it, it's kind of interesting, right? Because you have Zach Taylor coming over. He's a new head coach. He was someone that coached under McVay for a while. Um, and I, I think about what this Bengals offense or where they're headed towards, and it could be a complete chit show. I don't know. But considering Taylor was under McVay, you would think that he kind of takes the same approach as McVay did to turn the Rams around 180 degrees. What's the first thing that – you know, the Rams did when they signed McVay. It's also signed Whitworth, right, and became their staple left tackle. And that's exactly what the Bengals did, you know, in this draft. With the, with the 11th overall pick, they took Jonah Williams, the best offensive tackle in the draft probably, um, out of Alabama. He started every game at Alabama um, in his three-year career. He had 29 starts at left tackle, 15 at right tackle. So he's versatile. He could be moved along the offensive line if they have injuries and whatnot. Um, he went pro this year after earning unanimous first team all american uh writes he was pff's number one run blocking grade in the country last season he allowed zero sacks with only three quarterback pressures so he is just like he is someone that comes in he's not one of those guys that people talk about having like potential like oh the athleticism is there he was a three-year proven starter at alabama has the awards has the first team all american you know versatile and just has the production overall from a three-year standpoint so it's almost like a can't miss prospect in my eyes um now williams is going to step in and take over for Cordy Glenn immediately. Cordy Glenn was the sixth worst tackle in run blocking last year out of 80 graded tackles. Uh, Glenn is going to move inside. We'll see how that works. He wasn't good last year, but I'd imagine anywhere moving from the left tackle to another position is going to be a little bit easier on on any offensive lineman. Um, So when you shore up that left tackle spot, I think that's like an exponential improvement to the rest of the offensive line, which I'm kind of excited to see because when you have someone, you know, that can't give a Joe Mixon room or can't give Andy Dalton time, it hurts every part of that offense. Um, they also signed John Miller to a three-year, $16.5 million contract from Buffalo. He's an average uh, an average lineman, but it's an upgrade when you look at what the Bengals line was, and they were one of the worst offensive linemen, uh, offensive lines in the NFL last year. They also had their first-round pick from last year, hopefully developing a little more. They used, I think it was like the 21st overall pick on Billy Price, who uh, came out of Ohio State. Ohio State. He was a center. He was kind of a big disappointment last year, uh, but hopefully coming to his second year, you know, we'll see some more improvement. We'll see better offensive line play around him, which means a little less pressure on him. 
Uh, and I still have no fucking idea why they drafted Drew Sample in the second round because they re-signed like all of their tight ends this summer. Um, but he is out of the University of Washington um, and he is an excellent run blocking tight end. He's one of like the best run blocking tight ends uh, among the, the, the guys that were drafted in this entire class, which is a deep class and a pretty good uh, blocking class as well. So that's good. So I think they made some like really quiet, shifty moves this offseason that won't, you know, take them from a shit offensive line to an elite one. But um, if they could step up from like the 25th ranked into the middle of the pack, you know, somewhere like 15th, 14th, maybe even crack the top 12, that's huge for guys like Joe Mixon because Joe Mixon's like on, on the precipice of breaking out, right? He's right there. He could play that three down workhorse role. And I, I see a lot of similarities between what McVay did with the Rams and what Zach Taylor looks like he's trying to do coming in here. Um, and, and you know, making these moves in Cincinnati. So I'm getting higher on Mixon by the day. Yeah, I totally agree with that. You look at Mixon, I'm pretty sure he led the AFC in rushing yards and he missed a few games. He got like a knee scope and he was doing that behind a terrible offensive line. And uh, Andy Dalton, he played what, like 11, 12 games last year. AJ Green was out. Like him and Tyler Boyd were really the only mainstays in this offense. And the fact that he could like run as well as he did and produce like top 10 numbers, I'm only getting higher on him by the day, as you said. Um, you look around the league, there aren't many workhorse backs anymore. They invested, like, some draft capital, I think sixth round in a few running backs and, like, through undrafted free agency. But, like, all that says to me is they want depth. They don't want a guy to replace him. Yeah. So I, They took uh, Rodney Anderson and um, – Rodney Anderson and Travion Williams. Travion's, like uh, – Travion is, is very similar to Geo and Devonta Freeman, like those types. They're very – um, I mean, they're small, but they can play on all three downs. He's a really big producer at the college level, but he's not like a fantastic athlete by any means. I actually think Gio is a better running back than he is. Um, and Gio will be a free agent after this year. Rodney Anderson, he was a guy that like people love because, you know, he has the workhorse size. He's almost like a, uh, a Joe Mixon, but he literally can't stay healthy for more than like two games at a time. He had one year where he didn't end up on the IR in um, – in college so like he's more of a project and if he ends up getting hurt in the in the preseason or something I wouldn't be surprised at all if he got cut I wouldn't be surprised if either of these guys got cut but they do need some depth after uh they released Mark Walton yeah they definitely have no ties to like any running backs other than Mixon and even on the outside AJ Green is getting older but last year he even put up pretty good numbers when Andy Dalton was there uh Tyler Boyd is still probably going to be like a top 30 receiver and if this offensive line just moves into like as you said, like a top 15 line, they could like improve exponentially just because, you know, last year, Billy Price, I'm pretty sure he's like an athletic beast, like a freak athlete, as Anna would say. And uh, <laughs> it's kind of tough to like showcase that skill when the two guys to the left and to the right of you are fucking toppling over like a, I don't even know. Uh, they're just like, they're not blocking for shit. And you have to go out there as a rookie and like expect to hold your own against like huge guys like running at you. I mean, yeah, and that's the other thing too. Like you mentioned that he's, he's like a, uh, an athletic guy, right? He's someone that, that plays well on the move. And Zach Taylor coming in is is going to bring a much more fluid, um, up, up-tempo up offense, at least to Cincinnati. And again, it might not be efficient. It might not work at all. But compared to what Marvin Lewis was doing there, it was so slow-paced. They were running like bottom three in terms of plays per game, plays per drive, points per drive, like things like that. It's like you needed to shake it up after fucking 25 years of Marvin Lewis. And, you know, it, again, it might not be good, but I think it'll be good for fantasy football. I'm excited to see um, if this offensive line takes any steps up. Yeah, I totally agree. And um, along those same lines of like a coaching upgrade, um, we got the Arizona Cardinals up next. And all, as we you. all know. Look at you fucking making moves with the segues now. It's crazy. <laughs> here. You're going to look comfortable. I'm in my own house for once. I mean, it's ridiculous. Um, Get it. So <laughs> the Cardinals, you know, they bring in Cliff Kingsbury, who I don't think he's had a winning season in college since like 1972. But Doesn't, um, matter. Doesn't matter. He wasn't even born. Um, <laughs> so the Cardinals, along with that, like obviously there's all this narrative of like uh, Kyler Murray is like the next Russell Wilson and Cliff Kingsbury is like the hottest guy of all time and he can run 95 plays a game. The sneaky thing, and I kind of did it myself too, is the offensive line has a stigma where nobody thinks that they've done anything to it. And if you like watched our rookie videos about like um, quarterbacks and like what we expect out of Kyler Murray, I kind of fell victim to it. I was like, oh yeah, if their offensive line just topples over every time they snap the ball, the Cardinals are just going to be the same old Cardinals. But if you look at what happened last season, only one position along the offensive line didn't have two or more players play 240 snaps. Only one player played more than 11 games on that offensive line, and it was Mason Cole, their rookie center, 
who was fucking terrible. He led the NFL in hurries. He was second in hits, second in pressures. The team, it, it was right. like dominoes just falling down. They had um, Justin Pugh get hurt. He played only seven games. But in those games, he only allowed uh, one sack, which isn't that bad playing. I think he was playing left tackle. That could be uh, big lies only or big facts only. <laughs> you can see for yourself. Um, but prior to that, he was on the Giants. He's never really been the healthiest guy. But from 2015 to 2017, a three-year span, he allowed 39 pressures, which is 13 per season, which is very good. That's less than one per game. Um, even if he returns like 80% of that production or 70%, that's huge. Um, they did lose Mike Ayupati, who was terrible in pass blocking, a really good run blocker, but did that really even matter last year? David Johnson averaged like two yards a carry. Um, he was replaced with J.R. Sweezy, who stinks, but he's played like 15 or 16 games every single year of his career, and he was a seventh-round pick, and they paid him. I'm not sure what type of fucking combination is that where, like, the dude does nothing and you get money for it. I'd love that job, but um, <laughs> at least – at least he's, like, going to bring some continuity and probably won't die right away, as, like, all the other offensive linemen on this team have done in the past. Um, DJ Humphreys ranked out as an above-average tackle. He was the ninth-best run blocker last year. He also only played nine games, so that also added to the downfall. Um, AQ Shipley, who was the one that Mason Cole replaced, didn't play any of the season because of, I think, a torn ACL. He's coming back. Shipley is not even going to touch the turf this year. Um, Shipley and or Cole isn't going to touch the turf. Um, Shipley, I believe, was the 13th best pass blocking center in 2017 and the sixth overall center in 2016. Uh, the guy is a bit older, so these numbers could drop down, but it's a lot better than having like a late-round rookie be thrown in the, uh, in the beginning of the season and expect to produce. And lastly, they also paid Marcus Gilbert, who was the 25th best pass blocking uh, tackle and or guard. I think he's a guard. Um, and he played, <laughs> <laughs> he played just uh, 12 games these past two seasons. But he only allowed two sacks over that span and three sacks in 13 games in 2016. And as we all know, the Steelers are one of the best offensive lines. And he comes from, um, you know, that pedigree of being a part of the Pittsburgh Steelers. And altogether, obviously, there may be some injuries. This is, what is it going to be, June by the time this comes out? There's still like three or four months until the season starts. Um, there could be injuries. But as it stands right now, they could be like a middle-of-the-pack offense line in comparison to what they were last year like the worst line my two eyes have ever seen. It's like, it's going to be an upgrade. And especially with Kingsbury, if he can do half of what he says he's going to do, which is 90 passes, like 45 a game, that's all right, I guess. Um, they're going to be a decent enough offense and bring enough value. And if you remember last year, DJ was still like a back-end RB1 with these terrible like play calls of Mike McCoy, just tell him to run up the middle and then close his eyes and spin in circles, like do whatever he wants. So. I saw a stat on Twitter that someone – um tweeted out like the the number of runs up the middle by running backs and david johnson no. <laughs> it was like david for real it was like david johnson like 160 or something and the next closest back was at like 90 and that's so fucked up because the cardinals ran i think the least place <laughs> in the entire nfl like it's actually like people joke about it but it's like the most fucked up thing ever Dude, I want to see it. I want to see like a heat map. It's just gonna be a bullseye, like right behind the center. <laughs> <laughs> Literally, just gonna be bright fucking red. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I do this. This Cardinals offense is 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 like really. We haven't really seen anything like it. Um, or we, you know, there, there has never been something with so much. But maybe like when Chip Kelly came into the NFL, uh, and that didn't work out great. But there was some fancy production coming out of there. I, I think this is a team that's gonna go six and ten but they might average, you know, 28 points a game. Like, they'll be top eight in scoring um, because, you know, Cliff, while he says ridiculous things like I'm going to run 95 plays a game, he ran like 85 to 87 plays a game while he was in college, which is a ridiculous rate. But, uh, you know, that's what the offense is. It's up-tempo. And they have all these young guys who will be in shape, ready to go, ready to run. Um, it, it should be really, really interesting to see what happens in Arizona. Um, David Johnson – like can literally <laughs> get off my fucking draft list. I, I still don't want to touch the guy, even though I'll probably be, I'll be wrong about him last year for drafting him. I'll be wrong about him this year for not drafting him, but I do want some pieces of that passing game for sure. It should be uh, an interesting year for, for Arizona in that line. Yeah. And Kingsbury, he did coach uh, Mayfield and um, Mahomes in college, right? Yeah. Mayfield, Mahomes. So who made who? I mean, there's there's one constant. Cliff definitely made Mahomes. 
Mahomes, is, Mahomes clearly fell off as soon as Cliff got out of his life. Yeah. He was so, like, stunned by his beauty, he lost his voice, and that's why it sounds like Kermit the Frog. <laughs> I, <laughs> love, I love that his voice is like that. <laughs> First time I heard it, I was like, this is, I was like, who made this? I was like, this is such a good fucking, like, Photoshop video. That you have. <laughs> I, I was listening to, um, what was it, PMT, and they were like, oh, yeah, I went in the huddle, and I called a play, and Travis Kelsey just started laughing. I'm like, <laughs> that's terrible. That's so funny. Yeah, Travis Kelsey's definitely the fucking man. He's probably, like, one athlete that I would like to hang out with more than anything else. <laughs> He has, like, own reality TV show. So, yeah, all in all, the Arizona Cardinals, are they're definitely going to be a bounce-back candidate with, like, all this hype around them. And uh, everybody's kind of just saying that already, but nobody's really saying anything other than uh, Kyler Murray and Kingsbury. But this is a little more proof that they've really invested a little bit more than many people think in their offensive line, which is really, like, the like the first thing you need to have a decent offense. Yeah. We'll, we'll see how it works out in Arizona. Um, another team that uh, – <laughs> I, I don't know how to feel about the Buffalo Bills. I mean. Say his name. <laughs> <laughs> Say it. <laughs> don't tell me what the fuck to do. <laughs> Buffalo Bills. They ranked 31st last year in run blocking and 21st in pass blocking. So that's what we would call not good. They did go out this offseason and completely revamped the offensive line, though. They added three tackles and they added three interior offensive linemen. So six offensive linemen altogether. Five of them are uh, through free agency. They took this kid, Cody, Cody Ford, out of Oklahoma, 38th overall in the draft. He has some injury and athleticism concerns, but um, he has a lot of upside, and he's someone that could eventually turn into, like, an all-pro um, an all pro guard or, or a tackle. He's, he's very versatile, and they could kind of use him uh, on the line immediately. I think he's probably going to start at right tackle for them. They signed the Chiefs' second-round pick, Mitch Morse, to a four-year, $44.5 million contract. Um, and he's another one that's dealt with a lot of injuries, uh, just like Cody Ford. He just underwent core muscle surgery in May, but apparently it shouldn't impact his summer involvement. We'll see. He was PFF's number six graded center last year. They signed Jets guard Spencer Long to a $13 million deal. Ty Niseki, I believe, who's been filling in for Trent Williams, uh, for the Redskins over the last two years, pretty much when he's been in and out of the lineup. And then John Feliciano, $14.5 million deal. Lee Adrian Waddle, I don't know, just a bunch of fucking offensive <laughs> linemen. Just trust me that they what just a, name. a lot of names to a lot of money. Um, most of them are probably mediocre players, but compared to what they were, right, they didn't have depth. They didn't have any star power. Now they add that second round pick. Now they add Mitch Morse. They addressed it, right? And if they could stay healthy, at the worst, they have a lot of upside, right? Um, we'll have to see if it comes to fruition. But if the pieces can work out, and, you know, I, just looking at Buffalo as a whole, like, I, I uh, you know, I, I don't like I don't like the player that you like over there. Love him. Um, the, the tight end that they have at, at quarterback. So I, I, believe he goes, I believe he goes by the name of Joshua Allen. You know, they I, – I like what Buffalo is doing. They are building around him. They're not throwing a rookie into there and then saying, like, do everything for yourself. They get Josh Allen. They add six linemen in this offseason. They had Devin Singletary with their third-round pick. Um, they had Dawson Knox, a pass-catching tight end. John Brown, TJ Yeldon, Cole Beasley. You know, how good are all these players? I think their upside is probably limited. But a, a majority of them have proven to be – you know, good players in the NFL and solid pieces. When you have a, a young quarterback like that, you need veterans. You need guys who have been in, in a position like this before. Um, so I, I do really like what the uh, what the Bills are doing there, just in terms of building around Josh Allen. Um, so his offensive line should definitely see an, an, uh, an improvement over, you know, what they were last year, which was, you know, bottom of the league. Um, so weapons, offensive line should be an exciting year for, for Buffalo. And by exciting, like eight and eight. <laughs> that's, that's not too bad a lot of people be going through tables for that eight and eight so uh, <laughs> yeah. uh as for their offense i think uh not zay jones robert foster led all rookies in yards per route run last year and he was quietly like very good down the stretch and i believe like the last like six or seven uh rookies that led the league in that stat i only remember one of them was juju smith schuster but like the list was full of like a bunch of big names i'm not gonna say he's the next juju smith schuster might be a little bit better but um like he definitely he definitely has like a myriad of weapons, Josh Allen. Um, he doesn't have, like, one elite play mag- playmaker, but you have a guy like uh, John Brown who can win deep. What are you Cole talking Beasley. about? They signed talking- Frank Oh. <laughs> Come on, bro. He's still got it. All right. So that's like, 
that's like 250 carries down the drain. So uh, <laughs> as for uh, – and then like another 150 for Josh Allen. But I think for um, Allen's upside, he was like the QB1 over the last four or five weeks, just like the myriad of weapons he has. And as you said, the upgraded offensive line um, and like even more running, uh, running backs in the backfield, like for replays and whatever – I think it really opens up his ability to run the ball if he has designed runs and even throw the ball deep. He has a bunch of fast guys in this roster. And uh, they'll definitely bounce back from what they were last year because last year they were, like, nut low. But overall, the Bills, I'm not buying in too many of their weapons other than maybe Josh Allen late in drafts or just off the waiver wire if nobody else believes in him. <laughs> you, you believe in him. He, won't, he will never hit the waiver wire in a league that you're in. No, that's... Can, I, can I be honest with you? Don't I just, like – I talked for like a minute about the Bills trying to convince myself about Josh Allen, and that's why nothing I said made sense. <laughs> <laughs> no, it made sense. I was just about to cut you off, though. I was going to say we spent far too much time on Josh Allen. Yeah. But no, I, he is rising on my list a little bit. He's someone I'll, I'll probably draft somewhere yep. in my AAF fantasy draft. Ah, Jesus Christ. No respect. <laughs> no, I'm to the next team. I'm done with Buffalo. Actually, the buy-in for an AAF draft is probably worth more than t- uh, the league. So. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, technically speaking. Yeah. <laughs> All right. The last team I added in late just because of, like, a, a recent, like, addition. So, it's the Oakland Raiders. Um, they brought in Richie Incognito. <laughs> we need to have him in here. What an unbelievable <laughs> fucking signing by them. That's fucking ridiculous. He has all the symptoms <laughs> of CTP. Like, you're going to bring a current offensive lineman who is, one, a psycho, two, a piece of shit, three, is literally mentally deteriorating. Like, he's going to have – something crazy is going to happen in that locker room by, like, week six. I think earlier, like, maybe tomorrow. Maybe there's breaking news before, like, this video even comes out that, like, Richie Incognito just, like, throws hands with Mr. Big Chest. But, like, the, the different array of, like, personalities in this offense is going to be crazy to see. But, I mean, all in all, if you look at their team, last year they had two rookies on the outside, uh, left tackle and right tackle. That uh, top 15 pick, Colton Miller, at left tackle. He was the worst tackle in the league, like, literally the worst. Uh, he gave up, like, probably a sack every week. I think, yeah, 16 sacks, uh, 65 pressures. He put me out there. Let me put on 100 pounds. Just put me on left tackle. We'll see what happens. <laughs> Uh, so along with that, they had Kalecio Assembly, who's now out of town. Uh, he had a down year. Uh, he's, he's on the Jets now, but they bring in Incognito, which could either be really good or really fucking bad. Can't be really good. <laughs> oh, he was, he was good the last time he played. People. We can't just lie. <laughs> All right. Here, here's a little bit of big facts. The last time he played, he was good. Uh, through, like, the first quarter of the season he played, he was, like, uh, PFF's, like, all-pro. Uh, something or other like he was he was ranked above Andrew Norwell but that was a while ago and it was in a different system Uh, I just I just think like having a face in there other than like a backup or like somebody you don't even know about at least incognito you know what he might give you when he's on the field um Rodney Hudson at center was the number one pass blocking center keep telling yourself this shit (laughs) dude come on Richie incognito is a beast (laughs) he may like bully his teammates and like he, he might be racist but I mean, he might he might block. Um, we don't care about that for fantasy. <laughs> He's not on my fantasy team. Um, so Hudson was also a very good center. He was the number one, number four overall center last year. Uh, Gabe Jackson returning. He was above average. He was the fifth best, fifteenth best guard. And then they also signed Trent Brown, who might be bigger than the mountain from Game of Thrones. The dude is six eight three eighty. That's okay. absurd. He's bigger than my house. Like he is. He's like a cow on like at playing right tackle. They paid him $66 million for four years. That could just be John Gruden being, like, an absolute clown. But he, he was good last year with the Patriots. Um, and, I mean, it's going to be an upgrade from the rookie that they had last year. And an interesting stat I found was they were fifth in adjusted line yards when running either up the middle or behind guards. And they were 17th or worse anywhere else. So off the tackles or between the guard and the tackle, they were well below league average. And I think at least the upgrade of Trent Brown at right tackle will bump this up, um, helping the run blocking. Uh, like the guards are already very good. We'll wait to be seen with uh, wait to be seen with uh, Richie Incognito. But at least the right side of the line is um, uh, cemented in with uh, Gabe Jackson, Rodney Hudson in the middle, and Trent Brown on the outside. Um, so you should expect a little bit more out of the running game. And the fact that they were already decent enough in the running game, they were 13th in adjusted line yards and 10th in stuff percentage last year, um, and they had who was it, Doug Martin and Marshawn Lynch running behind them. Now they have a young face and uh, Josh Jacobs, who's like a one-cut runner who could be very good if he gets the space 
behind that offensive line. I think it's a major improvement. Their left tackle still leaves a little bit to be desired. So Derek Carr could be Derek Carr despite having these weapons on the outside. So if there's one player I'm getting higher on is Josh Jacobs just because of these improvements to the running game on the offensive where, line. Where are you targeting Josh Jacobs? Say 12-team league. What's the earliest you'd be willing to take him? <sighs> Honestly, like third round. Like yeah, I, I think I think that's I, I don't I think if you're not willing to use a third round pick on him this year, you're probably not going to get him on your team. That's the way I look at it. I, like right now, like I don't have my rankings up or anything. I don't even have like real rankings, but I'd probably rank him like around RB like 13 or 14. It, it might be like a little. I was going to say, do you even do rankings? No. <laughs> like, I, don't, I don't have my rankings in front no. of me. No, like, I also like don't like have rankings. Going through a draft or whatever. Like, yeah, yeah. So that's like three months away. But I'd imagine he's somewhere like around like RB, like 13, 12, 13, 14, somewhere in that range, just because I believe he can add uh, value through the passing game and with an improved offensive line, uh, maybe something in the rushing game too. Yeah, I'm, I'm taking a very con, convic, convictus. Like I, I have a strong conviction against, I was going to say convictus stance, but I'm, I think I'm just making shit up there. Um, I'm really opposed to Josh Jacobs. Like I really, I, I really think that like, he's not going to do well. Like there's nothing about what he did in college that says that he is ready to be an NFL. Like people just jackhammer upstairs. It's really <laughs> out of control all day. I thought that was Honestly, yeah, we're going to have to cut this out. I can't talk about Josh Jacobs one because of that shit Two, because when I do videos, I have to turn my air conditioner off in here because it's too loud. And once I turn the air conditioner off, when it hits like 30 minutes, it's like 90 fucking degrees in here. It's, it's out of control. So I'm sweating my dick off right now. And I need to turn the air conditioner back on. So you're not going to hear my Josh Jacobs take. I, I feel like I've talked about it in 70 fucking videos already. That's going to wrap it up. Um, you got any uh, anything else you want to add in before I start fucking throwing things? Uh, no, I did see. I forgot to put in like the Giants, but they added. Um, well, they have Nate Solder from last year, and they also added Zeitler. So they could be a little bit of an improvement. They also lost OBJ, and they still have either Daniel Jones or Eli throwing the ball. So I'm not too happy about that. Yeah, that offense is going to be a problem. And I don't mean that in a good way. Um, so that's going to wrap up the offensive line breakdowns. If you want all the big facts, all of the best content that we put together throughout the summer compiled into one place, you could head over to bigdogsdraftguide.com. Uh, we put together a draft guide each summer to help you prepare for your 2019 fantasy football uh, season. It's literally everything you need to, uh, to get your season going. It's got the top 250 rankings, positional rankings by tiers, the top sleepers, the top busts, guys, you have to draft, um, and like 78 other things. We'll, we'll, we'll put together some offensive line rankings and stuff in there, um, and, and it's going to be updated throughout the entire summer, so we'll keep adding to it. Uh, it's, it's very, very, very good value, plus it helps me put food on the table, so I kind of need you all to buy that. So bigdogsdraftguide.com. If you pre-order now, you'll get 20% off before it launches on July 1st. That's all we got for you today. So thank you all for joining us. Hit that thumbs up button if you enjoyed. Subscribe to the channel if you're new. Go follow us on Twitter at FBGod, at Nick underscore BDGE. And we will see you all next Tuesday.